This is our wonderful, wonderful celebration of 40 years of BAP. And, um, you know, we are a family. David and I were, David Nutt and I were just talking about how, you know, we, we get so much excitement from having uh, all these young people come into the field and start to train in psychopharmacology and come up through the ranks. And before you know it, you're a, a president and a past president. So it's all, all very exciting and it goes in a flash. We're also lucky to have Susie Gage here blogging for us and Ed Sykes from the Science Media Center, who I hope uh, many of you will talk to, as well as uh, having word, uh, speaking to Susie because she does a brilliant job blogging for us. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Nutt, who is the Ed Edmund J. Zafra Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial College London. David is currently the chair of the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs and vice president of the European Brain Council. He is a past president of the British Association for Psychopharmacology and is editor of the Journal of Psychopharmacology. And of course, he's been the editor for many years now, and it goes from strength to strength. He is also a past president of the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, that's ECNP, as you'll probably know it as, and the British Neuroscience Association, BNA. He has over 400 research articles in high impact journals. In ad addition to his uh, major contributions that he's made to psychopharmacology, he has been extremely active in engaging the public in science particularly in regard to drug harms. And related to this, uh, David was the clinical scientific lead on the UK government foresight project on brain science, addiction, and drugs. And he was chair of the advisory committee on the misuse of drugs from 1998 to 2009. David has also worked tirelessly for the British Association for Psychopharmacology over many years. He's been in many posts and he's helped us tremendously. And therefore, I'm absolutely delighted that he has been selected to be our guest lecturer this year. And David will be speaking on 40 years of BAP, a lifetime of psychopharmacology. So please welcome David Nutt. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, when I first was asked to give this talk, I thought, oh, why me? But then I realized I'm the only one stupid enough to have agreed, so <laughs> I've done it. It's actually a bigger talk. I also didn't realize it was only a 30-minute talk, so I've condensed it. And if any of you want more, you can come and see me afterwards, because it's about twice as much. So we're left with the distilled essence today. And just one note, uh, in some of the slides, you'll see a little asterisks, and those relate to d uh, achievements which have been made by BAP members. And the title, um, I was given 40 years of the BAP, and I added a lifetime of psychopharmacology for reasons which will become apparent shortly. The first thing to think about is why is introspection important? And this is one of my favorite quotes from Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's one of the reasons I got sacked as a government's chief drugs advisor. <laughs> In 1974, when the BAP was founded, Edward Heath was just being kicked out of office in the winter of discontent. The IRA had just blown up Parliament, and uh, I was a medical student in London. And uh, there I was, living in this room in St. Olive's Hospital, down uh, in Rotherhide in South London. And that was a community psychiatric hospital where I did my first elective, well, my only elective. And in those days, I was inspired by the concepts of community psychiatry. So there I was, a community psychiatrist working uh, in that hospital, which has no, now been replaced by executive flats, as most old hospitals have. And uh, there I did my first research. I spent many a happy evening going through piles of patients' notes, working out chlorpromazine equivalents for Tom Barnes' EPS research. And Tom, I don't think I've ever had an acknowledgement, so at some <laughs> And in fact, there I wrote my first prescription, which I'm almost certain was for Stelazine because that was the antipsychotic my consultant liked. Uh, and what's remarkable, and this is the, f the framing of this talk as a lifetime in psychopharmacology, is it last month, 
my trust decided that my clinic was too expensive in terms of the pharmacy costs, so they closed down my psychopharmacology clinic. So I wrote my last NHS prescription just a few weeks ago, and that was also for an antipsychotic, in this case a lanzapine, but also dexamphetamine for adult ADHD. And that's an unusual combination. I don't suppose many in the room have ever prescribed that, but I can tell you how to do it afterwards if you want. But it got me thinking. It got me thinking about the nature of my experience as a psychopharmacologist, clinically and research-wise. And dopamine was really very much the sort of the framing neurotransmitter, and I'll explain why. And um, the title of this slide, a paradigm case or too much of a good thing, it's, it's at least two puns, which some of you will understand and some of you may later as I go through it, but dopamine is what I've worked on and what many of us have worked on, and actually, paradoxically, it may have been a problem that dopamine was so, uh, such a powerful explanatory transmitter, because as you know, dopamine was the first transmitter to be implicated in a neuropsychiatric disorder, Parkinson's disease, the loss of dopamine in the substantia nigra, shown in those post-mortem samples, uh, was the first insight into what could go wrong in the brain. And the, the most remarkable thing was how it could be rectified by giving the precursor L-dopa to make more dopamine in the brain. And then, of course, drugs which work on dopamine have very predictable effects. Stimulants increase dopamine. They make rats run around and stereotype. They also make humans get more active and talkative, and they can make them... Um, uh, paranoid. And antipsychotics drugs that block dopamine do the opposite. They slow rats down, they make humans go stiff, and they stop them being psychotic. And this is this remarkable kind of uh, predictability of dopamine, uh, I think is something we assumed would apply to all neurotransmitters, and in some cases it hasn't. And that may be one of the challenges for our field, that we, we like the simple approach. And if I reflect on my career over uh, 40 years of uh, uh, being a doctor in 30 years, being a researcher. Some of my very first experiments done here with Phil Cowan were showing that alternatives to ECT, chemically induced seizures produced by GABA antagonists, sensitize the brain to dopamine, uh, as does ECT. And that's indicated in the top graph by enhanced locomotor responses to methamphetamine. And still doing it. 30 years on, we're still giving amphetamine to people, this time not to look at dopamine release necessarily, but also to look at opioid release. So two studies we've recently completed looking at the release of uh, endorphins as indicated by carfentanil displacement in humans. So it's almost impossible to shake off the uh, use or the study of dopamine in psychopharmacology, which is actually is the best evidence that it's addictive, by the way. Now, 1974 was a particularly good year for psychopharmacology because this is when the receptor revolution began. And so this is, must be the most famous receptor binding graph, in, in, certainly in, in the history of um, brain science. And it shows that, essentially, the, the effects of antipsychotic drugs are predicted by their affinity at the dopamine receptor in that the doses you need to give are very strongly correlated with the affinity. Very high affinity drugs on the left-hand side are given in low doses, and low affinity drugs on the right-hand side are given in high doses. And the fact that this relationship only obtained for dopamine blockade, it wasn't true for 5-HT or uh, um, acetylcholine or noradrenaline receptor blockade, essentially proved that these drugs work through blocking dopamine receptors. And that was a landmark, and that was, the, that was the study that really got me interested in psychopharmacology. It, the explanatory power of that was enormous. And of course, the receptor revolution allowed us then to ask questions about receptor function in human brain. And this is an early PET uh, scan. I pinched from Shachish, she'll be talking later on about this, but showing that uh, haloperidol blocks dopamine receptors in living human brain. So this, again, was one of the first example where you could monitor changes in brain uh, receptor occupation in living human brain using dopamine tracers. And from that, we understood that there is a very complex dose relationship between neuroleptics and clinical effect. We discovered from his and others' work that you need to occupy over 65% of the receptors to get an antipsychotic effect, but if you exceed an occupation of 80%, you end up getting extrapyramidal side effects. So the threshold for 
clinical functionality of an antipsychotic that blocks dopamine receptors is very narrow. And that's challenging clinically uh, and has led to innovations, which I'll talk about shortly, trying to widen that window. But it was, again, uh, a study that uh, markedly changed practice because before we could image drug receptor interactions, we were giving doses of haloperidol, which were way over what might be meaningful in terms of their receptor occupation. And the innovations which have occurred in the last 40 years have actually been, in some ways, rather limited. We're still stuck with dopamine. We have very selective dopamine drugs, such as haloperidol, pimazide. Uh, we have drugs which we used to call dirty drugs, such as uh, clozapine, uh, alanzapine, quetiapine. They've now been reframed as rich pharmacological drugs. And, um, and the, on, the only real innovation in my lifetime has been the partial agonist and the development of, of aripiprazole as a partial agonist. Uh, and uh, although it's an effective drug, it hasn't completely transformed the field. So we're left with blocking dopamine receptors and moderating the effect of dopamine blockade by adding other components to the molecule, such as cholinergic and serotonergic blockade. We've also had one interesting major discovery in, uh, in terms of possible end of phenotypes in schizophrenia, and this is the, the work uh, of Mark Larowell looking at amphetamine-induced dopamine release in schizophrenia. When Seaman produced his correlation coefficient between dopamine receptor occupation and the affinity of neuroleptics uh, and, and clinical doses that I showed you, he postulated that schizophrenia was a disease of too much dopamine. There were fascinating battles for 20 years between the Karolinska and John Hopkins group trying to argue that that was due to more or less receptors. That turned out to be an interesting artifact of the tracer used. But the, this is the one finding that I think has probably stood the test of time, which is that a proportion of patients with schizophrenia get excessive release of dopamine when they're given amphetamine. Those are the ones at the, in the ring at the top. And those are the ones which fit, I think, with the crow, Tim Crow's um, type one, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And the others, the other group, half of schizophrenics, don't get an increased dopamine release to amphetamine. And, and we don't really know what's wrong with them. We know that the ones who have a lot of dopamine release respond well to neuroleptic drugs, but the others don't seem to. And this, I think, is a really interesting end of phenotype. It's one that's not been exploited because, of course, PET scan is extremely expensive but it's certainly something that we should think about doing in the future. What about depression? Well, in my lifetime, we've seen evolution of antidepressants. We haven't seen a revolution. The revolution came from serendipity, from the accidental discovery that monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclic uh, drugs uh, had antidepressant properties. But in our lifetime, we have seen pharmacological refinement of those original drugs, as shown there, and also the use of animal models to discover other drugs, mostly ones which work through receptor interactions, that produce a similar behavioral profile. And we now have a range of antidepressants which work in different ways on different systems. And they haven't changed the field greatly in terms of efficacy, but what they have done, and what we should never forget, is that they have dramatically improved the safety. When I started in psychiatry, one of the other things that got me fascinated by psychopharmacology were the patients I would admit on a Friday evening with tricyclic overdoses. And I would monitor them through their state of muscarinically induced, muscarinic blockade induced delirium for three days. And it was quite fascinating to see the, the range of psychotic experience they had. And of course, some of them died before they came out of that delirium. And now very few patients die taking antidepressants. And these are the latest data. They're old data, but we don't have any more recent data showing that the SSRIs were such a massive advance in terms of safety that, that it's embarrassing that in the decade over which that data were collected, uh, we still had nearly 3,000 deaths from tricyclics alone, even though we knew that the SSRIs were safer. So we have safe drugs now, and that safety has allowed the rollout of these drugs into other indications, such as anxiety disorders. 
Also in my lifetime, we've seen a changed view of depression. When we started, depression was seen as a transient illness like breaking your leg or having pneumonia. Now we know it's a chronic relapsing illness, more like epilepsy. And we know from work uh, of a number of groups, including Jean Paykel, uh, one of our ex-presidents, that if patients are not fully recovered, their relapse rates are enormously high if you stop the medication. And, and those data uh, are consolidated by this work of the Oxford group, John Geddes and, and um, Guy Goodwin and colleagues, showing that the ability of antidepressants to prevent relapse, for, if given for a period of three years, has a number needed to treat of three. Now you compare that with statins in terms of re preventing a recurrence of a myocardial infarct where the number needed to treat is 20. This is one of the strongest effects in medicine. And this is the data you should use if people start telling you that antidepressants don't work. Actually, they're one of the best drugs that we have in the whole of the pharmacopoeia. And the question that these data raise now is not how long we should treat depression, but when is it safe to stop? The same question we have in epilepsy. We can treat people till they're well, but we then have to make a conscious decision to stop rather than simply stop simply because people are well because of the high relapse rates. The other interesting discovery in depression comes from studies around the 5-HT system. This is work of Sargent and, and Grasby at the Cyclotron unit, looking at the density of 5-HT1A receptors in the brain using PET, showing that depressed patients have reduced density of these receptors. And that this does not normalize on recovery. So that it looks as if low serotonin receptor number may reflect some uh, state or sorry some trait of vulnerability to depression it's also found in high risk relatives so people also often say there's no evidence that serotonin has anything to do with depression trying to d undermine the value of ssris but in fact there is evidence and this is some of the evidence and the other evidence is from the work using tryptophan depletion i rather like the way you can study s serotonin by doing PET scans, which cost 10,000 pounds each, or doing tryptophan depletion, which costs 100 pounds per subject. And so this is the low-tech way of looking at serotonin. And work of Katie Smith and Phil Cowan, and also um, the group at Yale, showed very clearly that in a proportion of patients, depleting brain serotonin using tryptophan depletion leads to relapse. It leads to relapse over a period of hours, and that that relapse can be terminated by restoring protein function or tryptophan availability over a few hours too. So this, is a, this tells us that depressive mood is vulnerable to chemical perturbations in some people, and that perturbation is around noradrenaline. And it's likely the same is true for some of the other amine transmitters. So this, again, is proof that chemistry is important in mood regulation. What about addiction? Well, there's not been a lot of advances, so I put them all on the one slide. Well, what we do know now is that pharmacology, particularly partial agonists, such as buprenorphine, such as veranocline, are very useful ways of keeping people away from harder full agonist drugs like heroin or nicotine. We know that a camprosate in naltrexone will help maintain abstinence. And recently, we've discovered that another opioid antagonist, nalmaphene, uh, will help people regulate their drinking and reduce binge drinking. So this is the first of a new class of agent, which I've called a drinking regulator or an anti-binging agent. And that is potentially quite a significant advance. In terms of mechanisms, well, there's been a, an enormous uh, amount of research done looking at the role of dopamine in addiction. And I think we can say now with hindsight that, um, and largely from the work of people like Barry Everett and Trevor Robbins and their teams, that dopamine is more involved with learning and impulsivity than with reward. We also know that the mu opioid and the CB1 receptors in the brain also have some influence on addictive behaviors. From largely, this is largely done from knockout mice, but now there's emerging evidence from human imaging studies that um, the similar kind of vulnerability can be found. And people like Anne Linford Hughes have done that work. Here's another endophenotype that's based on neuroimaging. 
This is PET or spec scanning of the GABA-A benzodiazepine receptor. There are three different anxiety disorders here, each of which um, show significant reductions in the density of this uh, receptor site labeled by uh, a benzodiazepine antagonist tracer like flumazenil. And you'll see in the bottom one, the work of Andre Melitzia, that in fact in the orbitofrontal cortex of patients with panic disorder, the binding of this tracer produces an endophenotype which is absolutely identical to the clinical diagnosis in that the patients, every patient has a lower binding than the lowest control. But again, because of the costs of doing this work, uh, this kind of approach has not really been taken forward. What we have seen, though, is the remarkable development of our understanding of the GABA-A benzoreceptor system uh, from using molecular biological approaches and then refining the pharmacology of the drugs which bind to them. And the intriguing aspect about this receptor system is its complexity, multiple different uh, clusters or subtypes of the receptor are produced by the differential coming together of the, the five proteins to make the pentameric receptor. And the distribution of the subtypes in the brain is really rather remarkable and obviously of some functional value. Uh, and that has been exploited to some extent and perhaps the best uh, example of where receptor targeted drugs are still have some sort of viability as treatments is in this field. Drugs which target the alpha-1 receptor, particularly uh, Zolpidem, uh, are now the standard uh, most widely used hypnotic. Alpha-2-3 subtype targeting drugs are very clearly anxiolytic in animal models, uh, as discovered down the road at Turnings Park by uh, the group there. And uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to get them into the market because generic benzodiazepines, which work on all the receptor subtypes, are both effective and cheap. And getting, it's really difficult in the current economic climate to argue uh, that improved tolerability should be recompensed by increased uh, a higher price for a drug. So those drugs are still uh, in consideration. The concept of inverse agonism was a fascinating innovation in the GABA system, and that's led to the development of inverse agonists at the alpha-5 subtype. You see the bottom there, that alpha-5 subtype massively expressed in the hippocampus where it regulates some aspects of memory, and turning that off with an inverse agonist uh, improves memory in humans as well as in animals, and that, those drugs are now under uh, study to treat disorders such as Down syndrome where there's significant memory problems. And also, and this is again a BAP contribution, Hilary Little and her team worked out the mechanism of benzodiazepine tolerance. And so the new benzodiazepines, if we're ever to get them, uh, have been created so that they don't produce the receptor changes that underpin tolerance to the old benzodiazepines. But then on the other side of the coin, in my lifetime, I've seen many, many receptor-targeted drugs come and go. In fact, there's too many even to read through. But each of those has come at a meeting, uh, been presented as a breakthrough, been tested in small phase one studies and shown to work, and then usually failed at the phase two or phase three. And there's so many of them, it's, it's almost embarrassing. And to my mind, though, the bigger disappointment is not that those drugs have failed, but it's that we still do not know why they failed. And we haven't made them available as tools for the study of other human disorders in which they might work. And that is one of the, I think, one of the greatest, saddest uh, mistakes and missed opportunities of the last 30 or 40 years. We still do not have the tools to address most of the questions we need to. And in fact, serendipity still rules. The, most, the new drugs we have today, like Volproate for bipolar disorder, agamelatine for depression, pregabalin for anxiety, have all been developed for other indications and then moved into psychiatric disorders. And we don't know how they work. So we're really in a difficult position trying to innovate when we don't know the core uh, mechanism by which these drugs act.
We also have a lot of current challenges. We have the pharmaceutical companies pulling out of neuroscience because of the cost and the difficulty of getting innovation. In the last decade, we've only seen five new drugs. Two antidepressants, agomelatine and vortioxetine, one anxiolytic pregabalin, and two antipsychotics, acenapine and urazodone, and maybe iloperidone as well. Uh, with the exception of agomelatine, these are all drugs which, I'd say, come from either a known pharmacology or uh, some other indication. And the other great challenge, of course, is anti-psychopharmacology. We're fighting it. We were f fighting it. My first conference was in Leicester. I went to present my data on how I could mimic ECT using GABA antagonist drugs. And as we approached the building, I thought, well, that's amazing. There's a reception committee. <laughs> and then I realized it was a Scientologist, and we had to be smuggled into the building through a different route. And it hasn't gone away, sadly. And uh, it's a remarkable that we can have a so-called scientist, Gutschka, saying uh, one of the leaders of the Scandinavian Cochrane collaboration saying in the media recently that antidepressants do more harm than good. So you, know, we, you will have to take up the challenge because I'm, I will carry on as long as I live, but uh, it might not be very long. And I want to just share with you, I hope you all know the poem from Martin Niemöller, the poem, Then They Came for the Jews. And I've kind of reframed that for psychopharmacology in my lifetime. First, they came for ECT, but we didn't use ECT, so we didn't protest. Then they came for the benzodiazepines, but we had the SSRIs, so we didn't protest. Then they came for the SSRIs, but we had the antipsychotics, so we didn't protest. And then when they came for the antipsychotics, there were none of us left. And you just have to be aware that if we don't stand up for what each of us do, there may not be many of us left. Okay, thank you. So how do we go forward? Well, we need to emphasize the scale of the problem, and the recent BAP cost document was really helpful in the press conference which followed it. We need to insist that government investment is proportionate to the cost of the disorders. We need to try to revise a regulatory system to take account of the greater challenges of developing brain treatments. We need to ease the restrictions on the study of illegal drugs like cannabis. And there's a cannabis session tomorrow. Britain discovered the active ingredients of the cannabis plant, but we have not developed them hardly at all because our re regulations are so restrictive that most of the development is being done in other countries. And we need to give human researchers access to tools that the preclinical researchers have. And I want, I'll briefly mention the ECMP Medicines Chest, which is an attempt to do that. It's an attempt to put in the public domain drugs so that those who want to work in translational psychopharmacology can do studies with the same drugs in humans as, as in animals. And there are four in the chest at present, an alpha-2 antagonist, a, a TSPO ligand, a GABA-A extrasynaptic uh, agonist, and a 5-HT2A antagonist, and hopefully there will be more in the next couple of years, and maybe that will begin to turn the tide. We should point, be aware and argue for an increase in public investment. Public investment in neuroscience R&D is low, compared with research in biotechnology and information technology and space technology. It's kind of weird how small brain research is. And if you look at the little, little blob below the brain science blob, that's the Alzheimer's blob, which is even smaller. So we have to have proportionate investment in research because brain disorders are massively costly. We also need to do some other uh, intellectually challenging things. We need to take fMRI beyond phrenology. We've got thousands of papers telling us where in the brain things happen, but I don't think any of us actually know why any of them happen. People assume that, as we do, that the monetary incentive delay task we use all the time has got something to do with dopamine release, but that isn't certain. Um, and I, I find it embarrassing that we haven't really tried to crunch that. We should be able to do that, at least in animal studies. We only have the ability to measure one neurotransmitter. The reason we talk about dopamine is because we can measure it. It's the only neurotransmitter we have the tools to measure the release of in human brain. Again, it's ridiculous. You know, 
technically, if we invested in this field, we could probably be able to measure five or 10 within the next decade if we made the efforts. But we're lazy, we think fMRI is good enough. We don't want to put the, um, the money and the effort into doing PET. And we don't have enough systematic evidence gathering. And I just want to share these data with you from the team at, at Cardiff, uh, Suresh and his team who I've been working with. And this looks at the resting MEG signature of a range of different drugs, um, ranging from GABA drugs through to ketamine and psilocybin. And what you can see is that they're all very different. Zolpidem, an alpha-1 intrasynaptic drug, is very different from Goboxadol, which is an exosynaptic drug, although both of them, interestingly, were tried and do have some efficacy in insomnia. Ketamine, a glutamatergic blocker, has a very similar profile to psilocybin, a 5-HT2A agonist. But these profiles I find intriguing and fascinating. I would like to have every drug studied in such a way so we have a proper signature, which perhaps at the very least would encourage uh, or accelerate the development of analogs and uh, facilitate drug discovery. I think we also have been a little bit lazy in the maths. We're all th we all think of everything in Gaussian terms, which is probably true for many things, but in psychiatry, in the brain, things may not change in a Gaussian way. And maybe we should consider a little bit more other approaches, such as catastrophe theory, where, which might have a much more uh, meaningful uh, way of analyze, analyzing things like panic attacks or psychotic episodes, etc. Also keep supporting your journal. We've been going for 27 years now. It keeps the BAP office going. There's enough um, surplus from the journal to keep the office going. It's a vehicle for the guidelines, which is one of the greatest things the BAP's done, and widely used not just nationally but internationally. And it's produced influential papers, and uh, Bill Deakin and Fred Graves' paper on 5-HT and the mechanism of defense has been cited over 450 times. And also it's an opportunity to publish interesting, challenging papers like on horse trade. <laughs> I want to finish by just asking you to remember those uh, members of the BAP who are no longer with us. Philip Bradley, uh, one of the early presidents, Lynn Poloski and Rob Kerwin, both council members, uh, Colin Ingram, Sean Spence, and Ian Reid. Uh, Ian died quite recently, some of you may not know, but they've all made major intellectual contributions to the field and also to the BAP. And I'm going to finish now by saying the BAP name is under review. I think it all will be revealed if you stay in this room till five o'clock. Uh, so I won't reveal it now, but whatever name the BAP decides, psychopharmacology will be central to the understanding of the brain and developing new treatments. And the BAP will be leading this. As I've shown you, a lot of the developments, the discoveries in the last 40 years worldwide have been made by BAP members. So celebrate that and make sure you continue to deliver over the next 40 years. And then finally, I have one hope, which is I'll be here for the 50th and see you then. And I want to say thanks to you all and also thanks to uh, the BAP team for uh, over the last 20 years making my life so pleasurable here. Thank you.